Okay, there we go. Okay, much better. Okay. <laughs> okay, so as I was saying, to hear Justice Alito tell it, as we've heard many times today, the destruction of abortion rights was necessary to protect democracy. The permissibility of abortion and limitations upon it, he wrote, are to be resolved like most important questions in our democracy by citizens trying to persuade one another and then voting. The history of Roe's death and the story about what comes next, I will argue, is indeed a story about democracy, although not in the way Justice Alito tells it. It's stor the story begins with an effort to use courts to bypass changes created in democratic politics in the direction of abortion rights and to revolutionize what constitutional equality means, and not just for women and other people who can get pregnant, but for anyone who might qualify as a protected or suspect classification in the United States, including people of color, people born outside of the United States, and women. It's a history of efforts not just to change the substance of constitutional law, but the ground rules of elections, the flow of money into federal politics, the relative spending power of different conservative constituencies, and ultimately even access to the ballot itself. It's a history of efforts to change the Supreme Court, and not by simply placing justices on the court who are originalists or textualists or even Republican Party loyalists, but also judges who are believed by social movements to be impervious to the kind of backlash that would accompany the overruling of an popular and well-recognized precedent like Roe. And so of course the demise of Roe forces us to consider lost opportunities like the one Felicia described involving championing reproductive justice, but it's also a reminder that the fall of Roe should matter to someone who is not, never will be, or has no interest in becoming pregnant because the fight over abortion has consistently, at least on the right, reached beyond the boundaries of the body to the ballot box and the very definition of equality. So the story of the modern anti-abortion movement is not surprisingly, shockingly, what Justice Alito would have us believe. Um, there was a an anti-abortion movement in the 19th century, of course, but not one that described its cause as a fight for the constitutional personhood of fetus. As Horatio Storer and his allies in the American Medical Association framed their fight in the 1840s and 1850s, abortion was many things, an issue of morality and patriarchal prerogatives, but not so much one about the status of a fetus as a biological person, much less a constitutional one. Perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that the American Medical Association didn't talk about fetal rights. At the time, uh, the antebellum Supreme Court didn't recognize many fundamental rights or privileges and immunities and tended to frame the ones that did as a way to secure and perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse among the people of the different states of the union, as the court explained in 1823, rather than as individual liberties. Those rights that did exist were difficult to enforce and often applied only to citizens, a category that of course excluded most black and indigenous Americans. This, after all, is the argument made by anti-abortion lawyers today. We don't see arguments about fetal rights, they argue, because it was pointless to bring them. This, too, they argue, is why we don't see feminist arguments enforcing the Equal Protection Clause until much later. But it's striking that the American Medical Association said so little about rights and personhood when so many other movements of the era did, because there was indeed a robust conversation about personhood and rights both before and after the Civil War, one anchored to the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott versus Sanford, which of course, as many of you know, suggested that Dred Scott as a person of African descent could not be a citizen, therefore could not have standing and had no right to be in court. The response in part to Dred Scott from many was that not all rights belong to citizens. For example, Abraham Lincoln, a trenchant critic of Dred Scott, acknowledged that Dred Scott did not deny the biological personhood of enslaved people, but nevertheless held, as Lincoln put it, that Negroes were no part of the people who made or for whom was made the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of the United States. Lincoln re rejected this proposition and suggested that at least the rights in the Declaration of Independence applied to all persons, not all, to all citizens, a category he suggested that certainly included people of color. Frederick Douglass likewise suggested that some constitutional rights applied to persons rather than to citizens. The key question when it came to the rights of enslaved persons, he argued, were whether people of color were, quote, persons or beasts of burden. If the black man is a person, he wrote, then all the thunders of the constitution may be launched at the head of him who dares to treat that man contrary to the rights sacred to persons in the constitution. It would have been logical for members of the American Medical Association to draw a comparison between the unborn child and the enslaved man, as indeed generations of abortion opponents so often have in the decades since. But even this analogy presupposed that enslaved people and free people of color did have rights, any rights. And this was a point on which members of the American Medical Association strongly disagreed for much of the 19th century. 
The AMA was divided between free and slave states, or later on between states supportive of and opposed to reconstruction. And the AMA's desire to avoid questions of racial justice only grew after the Civil War began. It was, as one of its members, Dr. Wilson Jewell, put it in 1863, an organization that eschewed all politics. And so Storer talked not about the Constitution, about, but about biology and morality. He argued that abortion was deeply wrong, a crime against nature, against public interest and morality. He suggested that abortion damaged women's health and mental well being because producing a potentially unlimited number of children was women's biological fate. Were women intended as a mere plaything, he wrote, there would have been no need for her of neither uterus nor ovaries. So abortion opponents like Storer had helpful insights like these, but said nothing about the Constitution, and the framers of the 14th Amendment in turn said nothing about fetal protection. The modern anti-abortion movement, one that formed in the 1960s, had much grander ambitions. In the 1960s, as a movement at first formed to block modest reforms of criminal abortion laws, anti-abortion activists demanded what amounted to a revolution in constitutional equal protection law. The movement, of course, at the outset was predominantly Catholic, white, and middle class, and at first argued that abortion reform was simply unnecessary, either because advances in antibiotics or cesarean sections made pregnancy no longer dangerous, or because, for example, pregnancy due to sexual assault or incest was all but impossible. And I'm sure to the shock of many of you, these arguments were unsuccessful and did not discourage people from pursuing abortion. And so if it was impossible to persuade people that abortion reform was unnecessary, or undesirable, anti-abortion lawyers began instead to argue that it was unconstitutional because a permissive abortion laws violated the rights of a fetal person. Precisely how took time to define. At first, lawyers drew on what was then called the, the due process revolution, the kind of spread of procedural protections for criminal defendants in, ushered in by the Warren Court. Surely anti-abortion lawyers and commentators like William Keneally, the former Dean of the Boston College Law School argued, if criminals or accused criminals had rights, so too must innocent unborn children. No judge presides, no advocate speak, no jury stands to be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt before the sentence of death and abortion is pronounced, argued one anti-abortion activist in Nebraska in 1962. But the problem with this argument was that anti-abortion lawyers did not want more process, they wanted no abortion. And it became quite possible that a procedural based right would lead to developments like hearings before an abortion could take place or the appointment of a guardian ad litem. And it was theoretically possible that some judges would nevertheless allow an abortion to proceed. Other movement lawyers turned to the idea of an unenumerated right to life, one potentially anchored ironically enough in Griswold versus Connecticut. They argued that if there were any unenumerated rights, surely there must be a right to life, because how could another right, like a right to speak or bear arms, make sense for one who was not alive in the first place? But these arguments, too, fell somewhat by the wayside as the abortion reform movement itself became more sophisticated and adept in talking about equality. These arguments gained some influence in part because of the massive health inequities involved in criminal abortion. Therapeutic abortions, of course, were quite safe by the 1960s when performed in private hospitals that served primarily white patients. And these were indeed hospitals that overwhelmingly served white patients. In New York City, for example, more than 90% of women who had therapeutic abortions were white. Municipal or public hospitals that served primarily a clientele of color performed many fewer abortions, and that left many low-income patients, including patients of color, to rely on dangerous at-home methods. And that meant that abortion, particularly for Black women, but for other women of color too, became more dangerous in the 1960s. In fact, the number of Black women who died due to illegal abortion doubled between 1951 and 1962 alone. This led to more arguments made by abortion reformers that criminal abortion laws were fundamentally unfair. As Dr. Ernest Solomon of the Commission on Social Action of Reform Judaism explained in testifying before the California legislature in 1965, the rich get the birth control they want and the rich get skilled abortions while the poor get neither. What was needed, anti-abortion groups believed, was an equality argument against abortion, or so at least thought Robert Byrne, who was a lifelong bachelor, a law professor at Fordham Law School who lived with his mother. Uh, he argued that the fetus was a classic example of a protected class, and he argued that the best analogy in American law was not between people of color and women, or people of color or any protected class, but indeed between the fetus and the black man. Of course, this analogy 
had problems. Uh, people of color were not dependent on anyone else for anything, much less for survival in the same way that fetuses or embryos were. And as the courts would later put it, um, fetuses were potential people because some pregnancies could end in miscarriage or stillbirth. Uh, to, these, of course, were real differences that could justify differing treatment under the Equal Protection Clause. But Byrne turned this argument on, his, on its head, arguing that the true sine qua non, the true juice in equal protection law, was not a history of subordination or its present day effects, but physical vulnerability and dependence. The more dependent and helpless a person is, Byrne wrote in 1965, the more solicitous the constitution and the law is of his welfare. This argument he suggested could account for the court's solicitude toward people of color because people of color were vulnerable too. But Byrne was alighting different kinds of vulnerability, physical, political, and even economic. He suggested that unborn children were the most deserving of protection because they were the most vulnerable, but that was not true in every sense. Significantly too, Byrne continued to argue that the law had long shown special solicitude for the interests of unborn children. Unborn children had not, he argued, been the victims of past subordination. If anything, they had been cherished, treasured, and protected above all others in the law. But a lack of history of past subordination was simply irrelevant to Byrne's version of equality. This vision, which spread quickly in the anti-abortion movement, would have had far-reaching effects well beyond the context of abortion. It would have called into question the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on race or sex discrimination, just for starters. But it was compelling to anti-abortion groups as they began to form single-issue organizations in the 1960s. The first of these was formed in Southern California by Dave Tom Shanny, who was, uh, among other things, the wizard behind Ronald Reagan's first successful race in California for the governor. Uh, he believed, too, that the key to an anti-abortion organization was good marketing, and the key to good marketing was claims about equality. Uh, one of the most widely distributed pamphlets in the movement, The Right to Life, explained, quote, if anything is fundamental about the American system of life under the law, it is the fact that we all have equal protection. It is the state's obligation to protect us all, the poor as well as the rich, the sick as well as the healthy, minorities as well as majorities, the born as well as the unborn. Uh, this idea of personhood was, of course, always an uncomfortable fit in democratic politics, and Tom Shani and his colleagues acknowledged privately that the protection of fetal life was more important than what voters thought about the protection of fetal life or about democracy itself. This, too, is the reason why Robert Byrne, in many ways, was not interested in what the voters of New York thought when they repealed many of the criminal restrictions in that state. Byrne, among many other anti-abortion attorneys of the era, sought to be named guardians ad litem for fetuses in the 1970s. And this strategy of focusing on fetal personhood and fetal rights continued even after Roe. Anti-abortion groups clung ever more closely to a vision of personhood that they connected uh, without any sense of irony personally to the 13th Amendment, uh, one that would ban abortions performed not just uh, through state action, but by any private citizen. It became clear in endorsing personhood as well in this era that few in the movement knew what it meant. Uh, some seem to think that it would include things like better support for pregnant people, uh, better neonatal care, child support during pregnancy. Others thought quite clearly that recognizing personhood would require the imprisonment for murder of people who had abortions and perhaps even their execution. These debates remained largely academic, of course, because there was no chance that a constitutional amendment of this sort was going to pass, even after the anti-abortion movement successfully aligned with the Republican Party, and I can say more about that later, and even after Republicans took control of the White House and both houses of Congress. The movement found itself hopelessly divided about what it saw as second best alternatives and did what movements on the right so often do when they find themselves hopelessly divided, which was precisely nothing. Um, this was, of course, a, a crisis for the anti-abortion movement, which had come into existence in many ways to advance fetal personhood and had continued to exist after Roe as a vehicle for fetal personhood in the Constitution. It was also a crisis because the movement had aligned with the Republican Party at a time when many in the movement were not comfortable with the Republican Party and had never voted for the Republican Party. And so what at this moment was the purpose of the movement? Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's dissent um, in City of Akron versus Akron Reproductive Health, which we heard already about once today, um, offered one possible alternative. Uh, Akron, the city, had been this, the home of an ordinance that was the sort of 
um, collective genius, if you will, of most of the anybody who was anybody in the anti-abortion movement of the day. And of course, it was devastating to the movement when the Supreme Court struck that ordinance down by a vote of six to three. But Sandra Day O'Connor, who had been much reviled in the movement and was viewed as a sort of secret abortion rights supporter during her confirmation, became an unlikely hero later on in her dissent, uh, which announced not only that the Akron ordinance should have been upheld, but that Roe was hopelessly unworkable. This inspired groups like Americans United for Life to develop a new strategy, one focused not on changing the text of the Constitution, but the composition of the Supreme Court. But that was hardly the end for arguments about fetal personhood or suspicion of democracy. Both simply went underground. So instead of openly defending the idea of constitutional personhood, abortion opponents wrote it into other areas of the law, especially significantly the rules governing child abuse and homicide. They did so to solidify an alliance with the Republican Party intent in the era on expanding criminal penalties in the nation's prisons. Uh, Ronald Reagan at the time tapped into support for various victims rights movements, uh, those representing families with members killed by drunk drivers, sexual assault survivors, and more, but Reagan redefined victimhood. He argued that those who had truly been denied equal treatment in the United States were not the marginalized, but the white majority who had been made victims of crime and even of marginalized Americans themselves. And he argued that the way to protect or vindicate the rights of victims was not to support them directly, but to punish those who had wronged them. Anti-abortion groups soon drew on this idea of victimhood. Uh, they began sponsoring laws that would allow for the punishment of fetal homicide from the moment of fertilization. And as Reagan declared a war on drugs, anti-abortion lawyers pushed the prosecution of pregnant drug users. A clear high standard should be placed on a prosecutor to determine willful malicious child abuse before any pregnant woman is charged, explained Clark Forsyth of Americans United for Life in 1988. But before anything, the principle that the unborn child in the criminal law is a person should be upheld. Of course, this too had racially disparate effects that were devastating. Research from 1990 alone found that black women were 10 times more likely to be reported to the authorities for drug use during pregnancy. And even when pregnant drug users face no jail time, uh, the simple fact of drug use often served as a basis for the permanent termination of parental rights. Anti-abortion lawyers, by contrast, describe these prosecutions as a major triumph. Here's a class of people that isn't getting any protection, explained Americans United for Life attorney Anne Louise Lohr in 1990. It's the unborn, and now we're finally doing something about it. The 80s and 90s saw not just a new investment in criminalization, but a new vision of equality under the law, one that played down the importance of a history of subordination, but also concerns about dependence and vulnerability. This idea began not in conflicts with, about abortion, but in conflicts about the rights of LGBTIQ people. Uh, following a series of favorable rulings in the 80s, litigators for the American Civil Liberties Union and Lambda Legal thought the time was right to challenge sodomy laws in the Supreme Court in Bowers versus Hardwick. The state of Georgia, of course, and it's defended its law in Bowers primarily by invoking precedent, but early conservative Christian litigation firms like the Rutherford Institute took a different approach. The founder of Rutherford, John W. Whitehead, had already made a name for himself in Christian publishing, arguing, among other things, that the nation's founders had been Christian and had written a constitution by, for, and about Christians. Rutherford wanted to reappropriate and rework the, a test that was already in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, the idea that unenumerated rights that the court should recognize were those that were deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. This idea could be traced most clearly back to a dissent written by Justice John Marshall Harlan in Poe versus Ullman in 1961. Harlan dissented from a decision leaving in place Connecticut's ban on the use of contraception for married people, but he spoke of tradition as, quote, a living thing, unquote, insisting that the due process accounted for the traditions from which the nation developed, as well as the traditions from which it broke. Lewis Powell, the likely swing vote in Bowers, had centered his analysis on the same test in Moore versus City of East Cleveland in 1977. But Rutherford wanted to develop a very different idea of history and tradition, one that could not change because it was rooted not in simply in the past, but in scripture and in Christianity itself. He argued in Bowers that the right to homosexual sodomy, quote, failed this history and tradition test because scripture and Western society as a whole has considered the practice of sodomy as within the proper scope of government regulation. When the Supreme Court echoed some of the ideas of Rutherford in its own decision, the anti-abortion movement had a new constitutional guiding star. 
anti-abortion groups began to argue that the criminalization of abortion was consistent with or even required by the nation's history and traditions. In other words, not just that there was no abortion right in our traditions, but rather that our traditions required people to be punished for the taking of unborn life. It seemed that things were going fairly well for the movement at this point. Uh, there were six conservatives on the Supreme Court. There were all kinds of signs that the court was going to overrule Roe. And then of course, the Supreme Court in Planned Parenthood versus Casey defied expectations. And Casey forced the anti-abortion movement back to the drawing board. It seemed to the movement that the Republican establishment felt perfectly clear comfortable using the movement to get votes and then placing people like Sandra Day O'Connor or Anthony Kennedy on the court. It was at this time that movement members became particularly enamored even more than they already had been with Clarence Thomas. Uh, they looked back fondly on Thomas's confirmation hearing, not because again, Thomas was an originalist or textualist, but because of how he had responded to the sexual harassment accusations made by Anita Hill. This they took as a proxy for how he would respond and indeed how he did respond when the chips were down and the time came to potentially overturn Roe v. Wade. A critical ingredient for the kind of justice who would overrule Roe they came to believe was someone who was impervious to backlash, someone who was indifferent to the perceived public opinion on a matter like abortion, and perhaps even someone who was indifferent to the idea that a justice was a steward of the court itself. And so the question became how to get more justices like Clarence Thomas on the court. And the answer, at least for members of the National Right to Life Committee, which was then the largest national anti-abortion group, was money. Uh, the idea was that more money would get more anti-abortion politicians elected, but more than that, it would allow anti-abortion groups to convince the Republican Party that an alliance with the anti-abortion movement was not a bad idea, notwithstanding the, the fact that then as now many anti-abortion positions were deeply unpopular. And the anti-abortion movement, relatively speaking, had much less money than others in the Republican coalition. The story, I think, about why money mattered also hit home in 1996 in the primary race between Bob Dole and Pat Buchanan. Um, I'm a little too young to forget to remember Pat Buchanan. Some of you may be too. But Pat Buchanan, uh, for many, was a racist populist who bore a certain close resemblance to Donald Trump. Um, he had impeccable anti-abortion credentials. He railed against immigration. He denounced women who worked. He energized white supremacists. And to some, he was good TV. Um, he was fond of uh, getting uh, to rallies, waving a literal pitchfork, um, calling Bob Dole the funeral director. And Republican primary voters ate it up. Uh, Buchanan run what was then the first in the nation Louisiana caucus. He finished second to Dole in Iowa, and then he won outright in New Hampshire. It seemed that Buchanan could be the Donald Trump of his era, but then he was quite simply drowned in a tidal wave of money. Uh, Bob Dole had as his the vice chairman of his campaign one of the Koch brothers and counted among his donors Gallo Wines, Philip Morris Tobacco, um, and even Nabisco Cookies. At that point, you know you can't win. Um, <laughs> so the fall of Buchanan was a cautionary tale for anti-abortion activists. They believed if they or other outside spending groups had been a kind of safety net for Pat Buchanan or others like him, it would be possible for them to triumph. And so they plunged into activities that would help, um, they believed, themselves gain more influence. They also had to address the complaint that they were racist and sexist. And this was a particularly damaging complaint in the late 1980s as the movement finally mended its relationship with the Federalist Society through the influence of Leonard Leo. The relationship between the anti-abortion movement and the Federalist Society had long been a troubled one in part because the Federalist Society included members who were not opposed to abortion or who were libertarian enough to believe that government policies requiring people to carry pregnancies to term were an uncomfortable fit. The relationship again was in trouble during the era of Operation Rescue, when clinic blockaders, closed facilities recorded thousands of arrests, and the ever-present threat of violence came to fruition in the murder of several abortion doctors and clinic bombings. To diffuse criticism that the movement was racist and sexist, the leaders of groups like Americans United for Life and the National Right to Life promoted what one of them called a strategy of loving the wrongdoer without embracing the wrong. And this was a familiar strategy to many Christians, but not an unproblematic one. As one anti-abortion activist asked, why then can't we love the doctor too, who after all was sort of a sinner? Uh, and what was so different about women beyond the fact that it was politically inconvenient to appear hostile to them? Uh, the answer the movement came up with from the era drew inspiration from an unlikely place, which was emerging lawsuits against tobacco companies. 
Uh, at the time, uh, tobacco companies, of course, had been getting sued for some time and often faring pretty well in court because jurors had reasoned that smokers had only themselves to blame. They surely should have known about the dangers of smoking. And in the 90s, uh, state attorneys general and private plaintiff's attorneys began overcoming these obstacles, suggesting that big tobacco as an industry was so sophisticated and so vast and powerful that it had misled even the savviest consumers. The war against big tobacco, groups like Americans United for Life realized could be a model for the personhood struggle. It could create a way of framing the victimhood of women and, and other pregnant people as contingent. Uh, these people were victims because a massive dishonest industry had misled them. This would make it easier to present a softer image to the public, but significantly leave open the possibility that women and pregnant people who didn't know what they were choosing might down the road be eligible for punishment. And this was a way of keeping people within the movement who demanded, pu demanded punishment in the near as well as the short term. These arguments too help to re-energize and make even more clear the relevance of, re of a reproductive justice movement. The arguments of course of anti-abortion leaders were that the problem faced by people seeking abortion or by anyone struggling in the United States was abortion, that the problem with healthcare in America was that people took a wrong turn and terminated pregnancies they should have carried to term. This of course ignored the vast health disparities faced by people of color and their inability to raise the children they wanted. Other changes in the right of the era made reproductive justice organizing more important too, and this included the rise of conservative Christian funders and litigation shops like the Alliance Defending Freedom, founded in 1994. Um, ADF became a major source of financial support for anti-abortion litigation, um, and ADF leaders tended to favor different groups than the ones that traditionally been powerful, particularly groups that framed abortion not as an isolated issue, but as one of many interconnected fights, as ADF put it, to bring the Constitution's interpretation in line with the Christian worldview of America's founders. ADF encouraged litigators to connect abortion to issues like religious freedom, efforts to preserve bans on same-sex marriage, or as they would put it, to stop the homosexual agenda. Um, Anti-abortion groups, too, I think, understood that this was more than a single issue. Even the single issue groups made this point. Uh, this was especially true of campaign finance. Uh, James Bopp, who is the general counsel of the National Right to Life Committee, founded the James Madison Center for Spe Free Speech in the 90s to litigate campaign finance cases. National Right to Life Committee ranked um, in terms of whether members of Congress were pro-life or not, based um, significantly on their votes on campaign finance reform. Uh, Bopp soon was in with the who's who of people seeking to get around campaign finance reforms. Betsy DeVos was on his board. And, Social conservatives in general became quite concerned about campaign finance, particularly when it came to dark money and particularly after the fight for Proposition 8 in California in 2008. California, of course, has robust public records laws. And after the state voted to reinstate bans on same-sex marriage, progressive groups like knowthyneighbor.org went online and posted the information of those who had voted or donated for the Proposition 8 campaign. And those people often faced tremendous backlash at their homes, at their businesses, and with their friends. This was terrifying to lawyers like Bob, who realized that many conservative donors who lived in major metro areas that were moderate or even progressive would be unwilling to open their checkbooks unless secrecy was guaranteed. And so when Bob and others began the work toward the case that would become Citizens United versus FEC, uh, it was dark money that he hoped to target. Of course, Citizens United turned out not to be a victory for dark money, but instead, as we know, about corporate independent expenditures. Uh, and anti-abortion groups were still ready to capitalize. It was not the case after Citizens United, of course, the traditional public party insiders, Republican Party insiders, didn't form their own outside spending groups like super PACs or 501c3 organizations, but uh, they couldn't control the ones that others formed. And this was different than had been the case in the Bob Dole, Pat Buchanan era. Anti-abortion groups hoped to elevate candidates like Donald Trump, who were so unpopular and in what some ways so marginal that they would have to depend on right-wing movements and carry out their bidding and have no way to move to the center to gain the support of more voters. And in some sense, they succeeded. The lesson of this, of course, was that changing the ground rules of democracy was important. And so anti-abortion lawyers have plunged ever more into the fight to limit access to the vote. Very early on, Bopp and other lawyers uh, drafted and defended strict voter identification laws that negatively affected access to the ballot for people of color. 
They were involved very on early on with True the Vote, which was formed in 2009 as an offshoot of a Houston-based Tea Party organization, King Street Patriots, uh, which now uh, trains workers to uh, weed out what they call voter fraud. Uh, Bop and other anti-abortion lawyers work closely with election deniers like Cleta Mitchell um, and organizations like Judicial Watch. And as early as 2020, Bob filed lawsuits in New Mexico and Virginia to stop those states from mailing ballots to all registered voters. And of course, in November 2020, representing True the Vote, Bob filed lawsuits challenging polling practices in 18 counties across the crucial states of Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, and Wisconsin, all of which the press had already called for Joe Biden. Uh, as Bob would later tell me, he grew disturbed by what he saw was likely to be failed strategy led by, as he put it, an attorney like Rudy Giuliani. That is not good news. Uh, he, told, he told me that he still stays up most nights playing out how much easier it would have been to overturn the election with a better lawyer or a better strategy. Efforts to limit access to the vote have spread. Uh, the Susan B. Anthony List, a group that seeks to elect politicians opposed to abortion, and the Evangelical Family Research Council, both seen as largely pragmatic groups in the so among social conservatives, have recently created initiatives to stop early and mail-in voting. In 2018, the Thomas More Society, which is known primarily for defending criminal uh, blockaders and others in court, founded its own initiative to limit voting, the Amistad Project, which champions, among other things, the independent state legislature doctrine and makes claims about voter fraud in state courts across the country. And yet in the lead up to Dobbs, anti-abortion lawyers insisted that Roe was the true threat to democracy. Let the people decide, they suggested, and the abortion debate will be less bitter and the reputation of the court magically restored. This too is the happy story told to us by Brett Kavanaugh, who promised a brighter tomorrow after the fall of Roe. What we've seen instead is what historians would expect. Voters have long supported abortion rights, even if they are not enough to give anyone a meaningful say over when or if they become parents. And given a chance to weigh in directly on abortion, voters in six of six ballot initiatives chose to preserve or expand protections for abortion or even reproductive justice. The 2022 election suggested that issues of reproductive justice do matter to voters, the views of pundits aside, and anti-abortion groups responded unsurprisingly by finding ways around the apparent will of the people. Some lawmakers, as in Idaho, have considered steps to make it harder to get a ballot initi or initiative or referendum before voters. Other times, the movement turned to venues where it thought it could win. There were state legislatures in what had become the movement's strongholds in the South, places that were either so polarized or so gerrymandered as to be politically uncompetitive, where lawmakers feared nothing beyond a primary challenge from the right or the wrath of right-wing donors, and were open to any number of bans, even those deeply unpopular with their own constituents. None of this is particularly surprising because from the 1960s onward, the anti-abortion movement has embraced a vision of equality difficult to square with what voters want and has held that vision up as far more important than majoritarian politics. The gold standard then as now remains a national ban. The problem of course is that voters will not pass one, Congress will not endorse one, and the key to success ironically has remained control of the courts and conservative judges. We've seen anti-abortion lawyers try to take abortion pills off the market by rejecting scientific evidence and seeking to gut the power of administrative agencies. We've seen the rise of the Federal Comstock Act, which doesn't require Congress to do anything or voters to choose anything because it's been on the books since 1873. All you need, of course, is a federal judge willing to endorse an interpretation grounded neither in precedent nor in the history of the statute. Of course, ultimately, the hope is that the Supreme Court itself will embrace fetal personhood and make abortion unconstitutional, a move as anti-abortion lawyers have long recognized that would make it almost impossible to avoid the punishment of women without um, somehow acknowledging state action. So from the beginning then, the struggle over abortion has been about more than Roe and indeed about more than abortion. Uh, as women of color have long recognized, Fights over abortion can't be separated from the struggle for good health care or social justice, and they certainly can't be divorced from the struggle for the right to vote. So what comes after Dobbs, I think, will change how we understand our bodies, but also how we understand the body politic, because from the 1960s onward, the fight over abortion has been a struggle over what we mean about equality under the law and who gets it. And it has become almost inevitably a fight over the kind of democracy we want to have. So. That was...
And then also there, McKenna, mm -hmm. you talked about how many years. But what you were talking. Right to best miracle sacred rights that we then slide up. Are we deploy? Involved. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is a lot of. Like contrast, marriage, mm -hmm. and Yeah, I mean, there's definitely the move that's always, and this is like, it's kind of chillingly consistent from the 60s onward, is that if you are a biological person, so there, there are three moves. One is a, a fetus is a human being, which no one can test. Two is that that is a, a separate, they will say a separate, unique, independent, and whole human being, meaning it's not part of the mother, it's the, the fetus is its own individual. And then the third move is anyone who fits those criteria, anyone who's a biological independent person is a full-blown rights holder. So, and it, it, it's weird because it's sort of strangely disembodied. They acknowledge that a fetal body may not be working, may not ever be viable, may it is physically within the person of another person. So it's 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 almost sort of genetic, right? They'll say if someone is genetically human, that gives rise to this full panoply of rights. Um, and so I think that's how you respond with the body if you are progressive is is really complicated because on the one hand, I think, um, it's about more than bodies, and this sort of biological determinism has worked very well on the right, and I think responding with more biology doesn't necessarily help. Um, but I think uh, the idea of how you kind of draw a parallel between the idea of personhood that I guess you would say the left broadly defined or abolitionists would have used in the antebellum or kind of 19th century generally. In part, I think you see glimpses of this throughout. And even in some of the people Felicia study, people who talk about personhood of people who are pregnant, right? Like what it means to be pregnant, um, what it means to have your decision-making, even if you want the pregnancy or you don't, um, taken away from you. I mean, I think part of what I wanted to do, the, the book I'm writing now to do is to sort of say there, there are 
culturally dominant narratives of personhood that are about very few things that have kind of crowded out what I view as potentially more generative ways of thinking about personhood, or even just the idea that maybe we shouldn't be talking about personhood. I'm a little, as a historian, I'm a little like, I'm not sure where I, where I land on that. But I think it's helpful as a starting point to say that if, if we're having a conversation about the rights that flow from personhood, we should not only be talking about fetal persons. And that's what I think in large part we've been doing for, for a while. So. <laughs> so I... It's me in it. Is based in the idea. <laughs> right? That uh, and then yeah. that the, the movie. Yeah, I mean, I think in, initially they were okay with the move taking you there, right? So like the kind of Robert Byrne era people, Byrne has this amazing moment in his papers where he pauses and he says, maybe we shouldn't be talking so much about abortion and we should be helping poor people. And then he goes right back to like, no, no, never mind. It's, it's just about abortion, like just kidding. But he has, he understands that what he's committing to would, would lead to things like protection for people with disabilities and maybe protection. And he's okay with that. He's not super into it. He's not excited about it, but he understands that there are sort of dignitary claims that come with personhood that would logically lead him down a road past fetal life. Um, and over time, people in the movement are aware of that and are no longer comfortable with it. And so that's the turn to history and tradition and originalism, right? Where you sort of are using you're sort of recodifying the hierarchies of the past, right? You're sort of saying we're not really, personhood matters because it used to matter and because the founders thought it mattered. And criminal punishment for abortion makes sense because we've always criminally punished people for abortion. Um, and so there's no more kind of need to explore the kind of dignitary claims that naturally flow from personhood. It, it doesn't entirely work because there are still people in the movement who are making those claims and who feel those claims and who I think are still debating what it would mean to enforce personhood. Like you see this debate, I think, playing out now and it's one of the fractures on the right. Like you see glimpses of this, you know, if someone is a pregnant person is driving in the HOV lane, does that naturally flow from personhood? This is the kind of question people in the movement like kill each other about because some of them are like, yes, and not only that, it also entitles you to child support and we need to make birth free and et cetera, et cetera. And other people are sort of like, whoa, 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 no, these are, there's nothing to do with that like it's a whole separate independent being and this pregnant person is just a vessel like we're not really interested in that and enforcing personhood simply means protecting against the wrong right criminally punishing the wrongdoer um and i think that's kind of where the movements landed too and that's another value i think in recovering the history because not only i think are we in a kind of fetal centric moment with personhood but we're a particularly dark one right where the the, the the vindication of the fetal person is just incarcerating people which like that is not a very robust or satisfying mission i would imagine even for some on the right and it wasn't historically i mean you see lots of people even profoundly conservative people saying that can't be it right there has to be more than that and then those movements die out i think in part because of the politics of the Republican Party, and in part because of the, the kind of regional reorientation of the anti-abortion movement. Like the anti-abortion, Robert Burns' anti-abortion movement is a, like a New York, Pennsylvania, Northeast, Catholic kind of welfare state adjacent anti-abortion movement. And the anti-abortion movement of the 1990s and after is the movement of like the Alliance Defending Freedom that's headquartered in the South that's very invested in incarceration and the death penalty in general, right? So, I mean, I think that you would have to have a broader movement realignment to have the less what I would consider troubling conversation about personhood, but it's certainly been historically possible. <laughs> but anyway. Okay, yes. Well, uh, I haven't been in Burns paper. You know, yeah, um, he's a New York guy for sure. Yeah, right after. 
We stand for the fetus, and the mother is. Mm -hmm. Sort of a criminal because they're opposed mm -hmm. um, of the fetus. She's kind of like. And their children, there are not. I'll say that anymore. Yeah. Really. <laughs> um, and the like movement sort of mirrors that. And we have to stand. Is, um, is itself the nutrition that mm -hmm. the mother's body is. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. The, I mean, the trajectory or the, the, the interests of the. Yeah. Kind of some kind of romantic myth. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I, I think probably. I mean, and this goes back to Rabia's question, but I, I mean, I think some of the most productive ways of talking about that come from people who've had abortions. Like, I think the most compelling ways I've read of dealing with that are in the papers of abortion providers, not of abortion providers, but people who've actually experienced abortion, who often will say, you know, I attribute value to this fetal life, and I don't think I did the wrong thing by having an abortion, who can hold both of those truths in their mind at the same time. Um, and this is resonating now. Americans United for Life just issued a poll in 2022 that asked questions like, do you think fetal life has value? Do you think the un unborn children have rights? And they were getting like 85%, 90% say yes. And then they asked, do you think abortion should be illegal? And they had like 30 something percent, the same people. And so what you were seeing there was there were a lot of people saying, you know, yes, I, I think unborn life has value. And that for me doesn't translate into anything being banned or anyone going to prison. And so I, I think it's, it's productive when feminists, and often it's the people who are the closest to abortion or the most comfortable with this with saying, you know, yes, there's a conflict, but that doesn't mean the thing that the unborn child, the fetus, whatever is, is a cluster of cells or has no value. Um, it can have tremendous value. And in fact, that's the reason we let people make the decisions because the value resonates the most with that person, not with, you know, whoever like Henry Hyde, right? Um, and I think, <laughs> both both sides have done this thing where they don't acknowledge the conflict. And I think it's sort of bubbling up like the, the manifestation of this on the right is the abolitionist movement, the, the so-called abolitionist movement within the anti-abortion movement, which essentially says, you know, if you are going down this road to personhood, um, what's going to happen is you're going to need to show state action because abortions are being provided by private citizens. And the state action is going to be that you enforce state homicide laws you know, against anyone, right? And so therefore you have to enforce abortion laws too. But of course, there's not going to be an exception for women and pregnant people there because there is no exception for infanticide or murder for women or pregnant people for any other cause. So they're essentially saying, look, from logical consistency standpoint, you are going to have to acknowledge the conflict. And at the moment, the larger anti-abortion groups are not hearing that, not going to have that. And I think that's true among progressives too, that no one really wants to acknowledge the conflict. And I, I think, I mean, I just think it's it's there. I think it's unavoidable. And I think probably either probably behooves both movements to acknowledge the conflict because I think sooner or later it's gonna come out. I mean, it's it mean that that's the fetus that gets Trump. No, no, or right. It's the person carrying it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
has also wrapped many of these same meters. And so Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm wondering if there is. Yeah, I mean, response. right. I mean, some. I mean, Jennifer Holland's work is great on this, right? That some of it is as a sense of sort of um, grievance that gets more and more intense. It, it becomes more pronounced. As, as white anti-abortion activists themselves become arrested. I mean, they, they get arrested for blockading clinics because they want to get arrested. It's funny because there's, all, there's this really intense discourse of police brutality, right? Like the re, we're the real victims of police brutality. And they don't acknowledge that any, this is like literally like moments after Rodney King and they're like, no, 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 it like, that's not, that was an outlier. We're the real phenomenon. Um, and so I think it, it speaks to, to people who themselves feel, um, on the right increasingly beleaguered. It intersects in this way with religious liberty discourse, which sort of assumes that um, conservative Christians are being pushed out of the public square and are the real victims. Um, and so it, it sort of starts, I think, as Jennifer's work really nicely documents, you know, uh, with this kind of aggrieved sense of whiteness very early on and becomes more and more pronounced, I think, especially with the entry of, of um, conservative Christian groups like ADF, which are kind of trafficking in this argument that anything, right? like. For example, if same-sex couples can marry, that is an existential threat to conservative Christians because the simple existence of that marriage will mean you can't oppose it or you'll be fired for your job or you will be um, called a bigot at work. Um, and so th there, there's a pretty strong overlap in that sense. Um, I think there also are strategic parallels. I mean, I think within the anti-abortion movement, the savvy strategists move from seeing themselves as abolitionists, right, from seeing themselves as people who are seeking their own 13th Amendment, to seeing themselves as the new NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. And the, the so-called new abolitionists are, you know, deliberately trolling the rest of the anti-abortion movement and saying you all are, you know, weenies and sellouts who are, you know, fighting in court about things that don't matter. And we're, you know, we're the ones who are willing to take up arms, like we're the ones with skin in the game. So it's also a way I think that people on the right have of speaking to each other about strategy and what strategy signals about sincerity. Um, but uh, a lot of it has to do with a sense of, of, of race and grievance and, and anti-government sentiment. I think that's the other deeper piece because these, these <laughs> the discourses about, about abolitionism also tend to gain a lot of steam when um, at the same time that there's more overlap with white separatist groups, with militia groups, when you start to have folks from those groups attacking abortion clinics and you see folks from mainstream anti-abortion groups saying essentially the government is is the reason that's happening is because the federal government is so unfair to us right the federal government is not allowing us to speak outside of abortion clinics the federal government is not listening to us and so naturally these radicals are going to rise up um so it, it's sort of i think generalized white grievance with some sort of more recent political developments making it more salient Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you so much. So in your in your talk, in your work, like there Mm -hmm. Even though if it's about healthcare and yeah. you know maybe housing and all the things, there is a way in which because they are mediated to abortion and because you know both conservatives and progressives go then to the legislature overturn the other side. Like the question is like if we move even one step back, right? The issue is not the issue, but but in a way, abortion mediates this debate. And what would it mean maybe now to kind of uh, a different, an alternative, and, and for, you know, Western carcerate, only other, the particular legacies that we 
that are not necessarily mediated by abortion and what can be yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm, so I mean, I, I too am frustrated by the sort of gravitational pull of Roe. I mean, I'm always amazed by how many different things people mean. So I mean, I think like once a week, a reporter from something like, like some fact checking out what we'll call and be like, you know, Mike Pence said the Democrats support abortion until birth. Is that true? Or, you know, and then the answer is usually somebody said something about Roe and some people are interpreting that as abortion until birth and some people are interpreting that as reproductive autonomy and we're all talking about Roe and there's no reason to talk about Roe and everything is about Roe and it drives me nuts. But um, so I'm a little, I mean, I think the path dependence is real and I think it's sort of hard to imagine in the near term, a conversation about anything healthcare or reproductive adjacent that has nothing to do with abortion. I think on the bright side, because abortion has come to be a shorthand for so many things in popular politics, you get ballot initiatives that get to do more work than just abortion. So California's ballot initiative, for example, um, has reproductive justice language in it, right? It, it protects you against coerced reproduction um, or coerced prevention of reproduction. All in the, and the reason it was so resonant, the reason people cared was because it was yoked to the destruction of Roe, which meant a lot of different things. It meant to a lot of people in California um, and end to a time when people would be forcibly sterilized in prison. So, I mean, I think in the short term, I'm more hopeful about imbuing abortion with new meanings, right? And attaching different ideas to the agenda than I am moving away from it. And it seems for progressives that we're in a moment where abortion is really resonant in places it really shouldn't be. I mean, polling would suggest that voters in places like Tennessee and Missouri are unhappy with, I mean, Tennessee are unhappy with their state's abortion policies and um, are willing, I think, to listen to what uh, a different agenda might look like, maybe when particularly it's tied to abortion, which is politically weird, right? I mean, historically, the opposite was true, right? Where you would see feminists, for example, saying we can't acknowledge a connection between abortion and the Equal Rights Amendment, because that will sink the Equal Rights Amendment. Or we can't, we can't afford to talk about healthcare and abortion because Roe is so frail that we will then lose Roe. I think because our current politics have sort of flipped and it's good politics to talk about abortion, there's maybe an opportunity to, you know, hitch other issues to it and hope that there's more political space for them. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one. Yeah, please. Uh, I was. Sorry, I'm wondering. <laughs> it had to come out. I I've read way too much about. idea. And yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. It, it also, if people want to hear people on the right fighting. So um, it's, it was Jonathan Mitchell's idea. And Jonathan Mitchell does not get along with anybody else on the right. Um, and so generally, he comes up with an idea. And his general approach is, if it works in the federal courts and everybody else hates it, like, I don't care. Like, I don't care if voters hate it. I don't care if it screws the GOP. I don't care if everyone in every anti-abortion organization in America hates it and me. Like, if it works in the federal courts, I'm good. And so he apparently, according to him and Mark Dixon, was thinking of the Comstock Act strategy before Dobbs and was desperately hoping that no one would say anything because it would make the Supreme Court, um, as Kiara and Melissa and everybody was saying, look stupid for saying that it was about democracy when he, he and everyone else was planning about taking the issue away from state legislatures immediately. Um, and it is uncomfortable. It had been uncomfortable. The, the reason it had, had not initially gained a lot of acceptance in other movement organizations is because there had been all this work to separate the anti-abortion movement from the anti-vice movement and to say this really is a human rights movement for the unborn. This is not about sex. This is not about sexual purity. This is not about contraception. This is not about porn. And it's not about religion. And it, interestingly, I think there's a combination of um, a willingness by some on the Christian right to say this absolutely is an anti-vice movement, like Anthony Comstock is a hero and we're okay with that. And then I think a more an acknowledgement by other people, um, like the people at Students for Life who say quite simply, like we can't win with voters and we're okay with that. And so we need to we need to fall back on strategies like Comstock that require neither success in Congress nor even really a, a, a cert grant from the Supreme Court on personhood. All we need is 
you know, a judge or two to say that the Comstock Act means something it probably doesn't mean. Um, so that's been the appeal of the strategy. And it's also, I think, a symptom of the fragmentation of the movement that you can have essentially kind of idea entrepreneurs like Mark Dixon and Jonathan Mitchell, who are not particularly well-funded, who are not, by the way, like, I mean, if you, if you can ever get them on the phone, the amount of trash they will talk about one another, like they all hate each other. Um, not well liked and yet can drive the agenda, I think in part because the hierarchy of the movement as a whole has splintered in really powerful ways, not really even just since Dobbs, but since 2018. So if you ask me, you know, who's who's the leader of the movement now, I couldn't answer the question. I mean, there, there are several groups vying for that position. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about foreign policy or sort of the international mm -hmm. realm. It seems like mm -hmm. Part of the pressure points for the abortions and reproductive. Mm -hmm. right? And well, white babies and then like baby granny babies. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, like if we don't have, or maybe our Vietnam or Guatemala are like, so where are they going to come from? Mm -hmm. They have to come from the bodies of mm -hmm. white Americans, right? But then also the, um, like the debates over like realist foreign policy versus mm -hmm. something that is like unrealist with this idea of like how much should we care as a matter of policy with respect to that that is not a matter of pragmatic politics. Mm -hmm. It seems as if that has been a debate of on the left, like do we intervene in something like Rwanda yeah. versus like the cash out on the right, but like what do we do? So we post mm -hmm. um, and this like, how do we operationalize or should we even think about that issue? It mm -hmm. seems to be moving around all over the place. The bizarre side, mm -hmm. the romantic sense where Martin Luther King says, if we're wrong, God is wrong. Mm -hmm. That sounds great, but if operation the rest of us says it that <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean I think that it Interest in international context is really fascinating. So on the right, there's a sort of romanticization of the global South, in part because um, they have there are more countries in Africa, for example, that have retained criminal abortion bans. And so there's a sort of very paternalistic, like people of color in the global South know better. And therefore, people on the right who are acknowledging this are not racist. Um, so there's, there's a kind of fascination there, um, combined with a, a, a real antipathy to international adoption and obviously an even greater antipathy to IVF that goes all the way back to the beginning. I mean, IVF uns is unsurprising because if you believe that an embryo is a person, there are all kinds of things about IVF that don't make sense. And the movement, notwithstanding what it says now from the 70s onward, has been very anti-IVF. And the most sort of recent manifestation of this was in debates about stem cells because the stem cell debate, of course, uh, Republicans, some Republicans were supportive of stem cell research because they would say it's being done on embryos that would be created for IVF and otherwise destroyed. And the response of anti-abortion groups was that therefore there should be no IVF, not that that was um, a, a right position. So, I mean, some of you know, of course, um, Amy Coney Barrett's references to the domestic supply of infants. I think there's a strong preference for um, domestic adoption with certain exceptions, like there's sort of subsets of people in the anti-abortion movement who are very proud of limited international adoptions, usually from Haiti. Um, but by and large, there's a, a suggestion that um, people shouldn't have to go beyond our borders to find children and that somehow their obligation to do that is, is a moral failing on our part, right? That abortion is depriving parents of the children they should be able to adopt. Um, which has all kinds of racial connotations uh, that the movement's interested in, even, uh, they, even as they hold up sort of anti-abortion groups, because they know they, they are, they've, they've tried like groups like Human Life International export all this stuff um, with varying degrees of success and have just failed spectacularly in Europe and even more spectacularly in Asia and kind of to mixed results in, in South America, but have done quite well in Africa. And so I think then use this kind of racial discourse to say, look, you know, people of color get it, like we get people of color, we're not really very racist. So the, the international dimension of that has an important role to play in their racial politics. Okay. Talk to you about, so <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.